Hello, hello, and welcome back to Pokemon Emerald. In the last episode, we got a little bit, got a few more levels onto our Aggron pans, and in this episode, we will be getting a few more levels onto Vibrava here, Beato. And since I believe Beato will evolve in the next few levels, hopefully we might get Beato to evolve in this episode. So in the last episode, I started talking about Scarlet and Violet. I suppose I'll continue talking about Scarlet and Violet, my experience so far in the game, my experiences so far in the game. As I was saying, I really enjoyed a lot about the game. There are some things that weren't as enjoyable, and I think the things that are probably at the bottom of my list in terms of enjoyment are, first of all, the school uniforms. And I think the vast majority of people agree with me on this. The clothing options are garbage. Player is limited to four uniform styles. There's a summer uniform, a winter uniform, and I forget what the other two are, but they all are pretty garbage. And you're stuck with those styles as the bases of your outfit. The customization is limited to hats. You can pick different hats. Backpacks, you can pick different backpacks. You can pick gloves, you can pick socks, and you can pick shoes. You can't change your shirt, your top, you can't change your pants. Your options for shirt and pants are basically the shorts that you start the game with, or some long slacks from the winter uniform, and it's the same for the top. The top is either the top you start with, a top with a vest over it, or a formal top that goes with the slacks that is a button-up blazer with a tie. That's it. That is your base clothing options. The hair options are also pretty limited in my experience so far. I haven't gotten to the end game, so I don't know if more hair unlocks eventually, but a bunch of useless hairstyles. Very bland. Not a whole lot of variety. There's it's good to choose color. I can say that. The colors are nice. Styles are pretty mid. So the clothing options and sword and shield. I'm trying to think how I would rank the clothing options. It's hard to say. I probably rank Sword and Shield at the top. Best clothing options, greatest drip you could have on your player character customizations. Under it, Sun and Moon, and then X and Y, and then at the bottom, Scarlet and Violet so far. Abysmal. Can't believe it. Can't believe they've done this. The Now, the only reason I say for now in terms of Scarlet and Violet is my expectation is that they're going to do DLC. I think at this point it's a given that they will do DLC. They did DLC for Sword and Shield. So I expect there will be some DLC content for Scarlet and Violet. My expectation is that for the Scarlet and Violet DLC, they will unlock and open up customization, full player customization. They will get new outfits so that we can change our top and our bottom so that we aren't stuck in the same stupid school uniform. And we get all the player customization options for clothing that we had in Scar in Sword and Shield. I think that's a reasonable expectation to be part of the DLC. So 
so that's my expectation. Maybe it will be a, you know, a graduation DLC where you graduate from the school so you no longer have to wear your school uniform. Then you get full clothing customization options. Or, they could stick to the school theme, which I hope they don't. I really hope they don't. Because if they stick to the school's theme, then all they're going to add is a bunch of stuff that doesn't even matter. Maybe some hairstyles, some maybe some more dumb hats, maybe some dumb gloves and socks, and you know, glasses, and then that'll be it for customization. And that will leave Sword and she uh, Scarlet and Violet as the worst player customization in Pokemon games. Since the introduction of player customization in terms of clothing and changing your hair and all that. And that would be, that would be a massive downgrade. And I'm not even a person that's so, I'm not even a person that is super duper duper into the character customization. I usually do minor customization to my character. I will like change the hair from the base hair, maybe the eye color, and throw on some different clothing if I come up if I come across something that I like in the clothing stores. So I'm not one of those people that's big, big obsessed with uh, with digging out my character, but I know that is a hugely popular part of the game. Customizing your trainer. So, and I know Game Freak is definitely aware of that. So, the decision to limit the player, to limit the player to the really awful school uniforms, they had to have known that would be like, they had to have known that would be controversial and upset a lot of fans. So my thinking is, they had to have done that with something in mind something in mind to fix that issue. That is why my thought was DLC. DLC that unlocks full character customization. It's perfect. People will love it. People will be, people will be happy that they can finally customize their character to the levels that they could in Sword and Shield and maybe even beyond. It will make a whole lot of money on that DLC. It will have a whole lot of appeal. Going beyond the adding, adding access to new Pokemon, new areas, new story content, stuff like that. That's all well and good. But you know, character customization, that's where you make money. Look at the skins in these uh, evergreen competitive titles like League of Legends and Overwatch and well, Overwatch isn't exactly evergreen, but you know what I mean. Skins make bank. So if they have player customization as DLC, that will probably end up being the best deal selling DLC since DLC has been introduced, even though the only DLC in Pokemon before that were the two Sword and Shield expansions, so. But if they, if Game Freak has figured out, hey, Skins make bank on their second DLC outing. That's smart. I'll admit that's smart. So hopefully that's what they do. If not, we will be stuck with these school uniforms for an entire generation. Three, minimum of three years, probably more than three years, where the player customization is absolute trash bags. As someone that wasn't so deeply, but that's the thing. If someone like me, who isn't obsessed with character customization, is upset by the lack of options, imagine the people that live and die by character customization. Imagine how much of a turnoff those uniforms are to them. There's got to be 
some reasoning behind it besides, well, they're at school, so they should wear a school uniform. And that's as far as we thought. I refuse to believe that. So, character customization. That's number one on the list of things that are bad about the game. Number two. Now this is expected. Number two. This is expected, but still a thing. Not having access to the full Pokedex. I know that after the whole exit thing, this was entirely blown out of proportion, I personally believe, it was blown out of proportion by a lot of people that have had a lot of criticisms slash hatred towards the Pokemon franchise overall in general, whether they be legitimate or not, and they latched on to the Dexit thing because that had gained a lot of ground because it was something that was upsetting to a lot of people across the range of Pokemon fans. So that got kind of co-opted and hijacked by general haters rather than people that had criticism and concerns about the idea of the full Pokedex not being available. And of course, as with as with consumer reactions like this that get hijacked by people that may have less than that may have less than uh, pure intentions. It ends up it ends up hurting the validity of the criticism of the consumer reaction overall. So it went from a lot. Hey, you know, a lot of fans are kind of upset about this whole Pokedex thing. You know, it's the first time in the series. The real first time in the series where entire swaths of Pokemon are entirely unaccessible in the game, you know? It's, it's concerning. Maybe it's something that should be addressed. Maybe it's an idea that isn't quite right to be implemented at this point in the franchise. We could have had those discussions, but it was taken over by, you know, the Game Freak ran out of ideas 50 years ago, people that have been hating the franchise, or people that just hate the franchise in general, and have hated it from the very beginning. They don't understand why Pokemon has any appeal, they wish it would die and go away, blah blah blah. Got taken over by those people, and uh, the discussion devolved into nothing that could be constructive for anyone and nothing constructive could be taken away from it and all constructive criticism got lost in the sauce as they say but that is the nature of social media and twitter and how these things happen and they quickly get hijacked and they quickly become uh and they quickly become circus shows that are entirely useless. But as we are uh, stand on the other side of that mess, the concern does still remain. Hey, you know, there are 1,000 varieties, or 1,000 species now, officially 1,000 species of Pokemon. Yes, it is a lot. And yes, it is kind of. It is kind of a tall order to ask for Game Freak to implement every single Pokemon in every single game going forward. 1,000, 1,000 character models, character models that ideally people want to have all kinds of expressions, unique poses, actions, animations. They all have their individual sounds, they have cries, their evolutionary stages, their shiny variations. Version exclusives, alternate forms, evolutions, mega evolutions, terrestrial, terrestrializing, you know, uh, Gigantamax forms, Dynamax forms. Okay, yes, it's a lot.
and I I understand that. I'm not angry at Game Freak for the decision uh, for the decision to cut the decks and make it so that species kind of rotates depending on the game. So putting that to the side. Still a concern. I think that maybe for the first game, a further game that crosses or reaches the 1,000 Pokémon threshold, it would be nice if the players would be able to access and use all 1,000 Pokémon in that game, that particular game. And then going forward, you can do this poke has only 400 accessible. This game has only. 400 accessible. This game only has 500 accessible. So that's another complaint, a minor one. Oh, and as I said, I only put it as a complaint because it's something. It is a concern. It's a minor one, but it is a concern. think about what else I don't really like as much about Scarlet and Violet. Oh yes, the NPC designs, as in the trainer designs, they are limited. They use a lot of variations of the students because at the um, academy in the game the students in the class are all age ranges. So you have adult students, you have kids students, you have children students, you have senior students, senior citizen students. So throughout the game, at least in my experience so far, most of the trainers I've encountered have been other students. So they're all wearing stupid school uniform. And that's it. I haven't seen many variations of trainers outside of that. I've seen some musicians, which they look like they're country music stars in this game, so they have cowboy hats and denim and vests and stuff like that, which is cool. I've seen hikers. Thankfully the hiker trainer class survived. I believe that I've seen some children that are not students, so kind of the youngster class sort of the youngster class. I've seen a few dragon tamers, so that class survived. Notice how I can count the number of trainer classes that have survived. That's because, so far, in my experience, the trainer classes have been severely reduced. Along with that, the number of trainers that appear in the game has been severely reduced. You know how routes would be just, you know, bursting with trainers that would challenge you? Now the routes... Maybe it's because of the whole open world aspects. Maybe that's a consequence of that. But the routes are dotted with just a few trainers. So in between, you know, one town and the other, there's a huge expanse of area. It's mostly wilderness with wild Pokemon and stuff ledges and cliffs you can climb up, other paths you can take to explore different areas. And only one, two, or three trainers on that whole area. One or two or three NPC trainers to battle in that whole area. It's not good. So that's a criticism that I have. There are too few NPC trainers to battle, at least in my experience so far. Maybe by the late game they'll have areas that are more like the routes in previous games where they are full of NPC trainers. Or at least a decent amount of NPC trainers. So I guess I'll put that all I'll put that all into one thing. The class. NPC trainers. There are too few of them. Their designs are garbage. 
the designs are limited and garbage and also they do not auto battle you when they make eye contact which is another one of those things that goes back to that discussion that I sort of started in the last video about what is Pokemon what is essentially Pokemon and I think this is one of those things that is definitely in that realm of essentially Pokemon when you make eye contact when you cross the line of sight of the enemy trainers they are supposed to activate and run up to you and challenge you that is that is Pokemon and it is something that has been removed maybe it maybe this is yet another consequence of the open world decision I but then it reaches a point where like how much how much of the critical elements of Pokemon have to be sacrificed in the name of this transition to an open world style because it reaches a point where you're sacrificing too much to gain too little and I think that for a lot of people they were okay with just letting that little thing go so I think I might be in the minority on in carrying on this one but it is a personal thing that I feel is not right it's something that I personally don't agree with and have concerns about the idea that NPC trainers are so they're lackluster and I guess adding another bullet point to the NPC trainer criticism is that the NPC trainers have and this is something that has been it's been the trend since the move to I won't even say since the move to 3D Pokemon but yeah since the move to 3D Pokemon is the trainers have too few Pokemon every trainer has one two Pokemon three at the very maximum which is an insult it's an insult to people that have played through the series and are used to at least starting out battling trainers that had teams full teams I know in a lot of the early games those teams were just repeats of the same Pokemon over and over again, you know, 3 Machop or 6 Magikarp, but still, it was an entire team. In a game, or in taking this concept, taking this to the base concept, in a world where Pokemon trainers can carry up to a full team of 6. You would expect that, yeah, people starting out would probably only have one, two, or three Pokemon. But as you get to fighting the more experienced class of trainers, when you get to the late game areas, you would expect that, even by the mid game, you would expect that people, that Pokemon trainers, would be carrying around teams of significantly powerful and significant numbers of Pokemon, as many as they could carry. Why not carry around six Pokemon if that's your limit? If you're a Pokemon trainer and you have that ability. Why carry three when you can carry six? <laughs> and I think that it could have been a midi if they had implemented more full teams or more teams that are at least more than one or two Pokemon. I mean at least make the majority of the trainers have three to six Pokemon. I think that would have mitigated the issue of there being so few trainers along the areas. I should stop calling them routes because proper routes as they used to exist don't exist in Scarlet and Violet. They are areas. Which are just, you know, chunks of the map. So. I think it could have mitigated the issue if the trainers in the areas, the few trainers that exist in the areas, had full teams and 
another thing that they could do, I don't know if they've implemented this or how they've implemented it. I think it might be something that they've implemented. But I haven't reached the end game, I haven't done any research on the game mechanics and stuff due to worry about spoilers, but if they made all the trainers on the in the areas rebattleable, that could have been that could have been a mitigating factor. Because if you can rebattle the trainers. Oh look at that. Speaking of rebattling trainers. But if you can rebattle the trainers in the areas, maybe the teams will get a little bit stronger with each rematch. That would have been something That would have been something that could avoid the whole issue of That would have been something that could avoid some of the issues with there being so few NPC trainers around to battle. So I think that's it for the bullet points on the whole NPC trainers issue. Let me think and make sure. gone over the options, the variety of NPC trainers being trashed, their teams being garbage, there are too few of them, the designs, too few of them, their teams being bad, but yes they don't activate properly, you have to walk up to them and talk to them, rather than if the trainer meets your eyesight, then a battle happens, which is something that is in the lore. I mean, it's, it's been a critical part of the lore since the very first game, like the very first trainers you encounter in the very first game tell you, hey man, you know, if you if you make eye contact, if you enter the trainer's line of sight, then you gotta fight him. And it has been a staple in every game since that the first trainer usually explains that to you. Hey, yo, man, if you make eye contact, then we gotta fight. And for Scarlet and Violet to just kind of unceremoniously drop that rule as if it never existed, just. just leaves a bad taste. But not to retread that. So I think we covered that. So what else? Now the graphics thing, I'm not gonna put that personally as something that I'm concerned with because I believe it will be patched. Like, I mean, there'll be a patch for the frame rate issues, the crashing, and the, you know, probably the egregious graphical glitches. But in terms of the overall graphical style, I personally am fine with it. I've never been one of those people that needs Pokemon to look like I don't even know what, to look like a, a PC game, to look like Crisis 3 running on full settings on the biggest PC beast machine. I'm generally fine with the Pokemon games as they are. I had no issue with Sword and Shield graphics, and I have no issue with Scarlet and Violet's graphical styles and design choices in terms of the overall appearance of the overall graphical presentation. The glitches are another thing, I think those will be patched, so I'm not going to leave them as a complaint since I expect they will be fixed. If they aren't fixed, then they would be a complaint. A legitimate criticism is something that I don't like about the game. So 
So what else? Let me think. I'm satisfied with the Pokemon. Oh, here's something that's sort of. Maybe I'll call this a half complaint, half concern sort of thing. Goes back to the issue that I discussed a little bit. I think in one of the videos before the release of Scarlet and Violet, the one of the, um, the issue of regional variants. Now, Scarlet and Violet has done something that is. They've done something that is very interesting. In terms of regional variants, so far I've seen one. I think one or two. Is it two? Two regional variants, maybe? But anyway, they've done something new, which is, from the pre-release content, those of you that follow the pre-release content, we know that Wiglet exists, which is not a Diglet. It's not a regional variant of Diglet. It's an entirely different species of Pokemon that happens to look like Diglet, because they evolved in a way that made an appearance similar to Diglet evolutionarily advantageous. Just by coincidence, not like looking like Diglett helped them avoid predators or anything like that. It's just coincidence. They're an eel, and they're based on a real life eel that happened to look like a worm. Or in the case of in the case of Wiglet and Diglett, it's an eel that happens to look like Diglett, which is a mole Pokemon. It's kind of like a mole, yeah, like it's mole. They've done that with a few other species of Pokemon. Pokemon that looks like a previously revealed Pokemon, but you know, different colored, slightly different, slight variation. But it is technically a different, but it is not technically, it is entirely a different species. It just happens to look exactly like Pokemon X or Pokemon B or Pokemon W. I... I kind of have, I guess, mixed feelings about those Pokemon. I don't even know what to classify them as. Like, what do they call that uh, phenomenon in real life? Not Covergent Evolution or... Was it Covergent Evolution, or...? I forget what the term was for it was, but you know... It's like how... It's like how species that are unrelated all develop the same evolutionary features slash strategies to... Because they were optimal for their existence in whatever environment, like for instance, bats, birds, and some insects. They all have wings. That doesn't make bats, birds, and insects related to each other. They don't all have wings because they're related. They have wings because in their environments for their particular species survival, their purposes, they all evolved wings because they needed to evolve wings because flight was the best option for them evolutionarily. So they all bear that similarity of having wings by what is a, an evolutionary coincidence slash need that helped them best fulfill their niche, not because they're related or the same species. And I think that's sort of the idea they're going for with these Pokemon like Wiglet that look like existing Pokemon, but they're not that species, they're not a regional variant. Conceptually, I like the idea because, of course, it applies to real life and real world animals. So it makes perfect sense that there would be, there would be 
a lot of Pokemon that look like that look like other Pokemon just out of you know natural evolution. Does that make sense? And on the other hand, on the other hand, it is when you take away all the reasoning and stuff and just look at it, it's regional variant. So, they kind of had a way of putting in a regional variant without technically putting in a regional variant because it's not technically regional variant. Like, Wiglet is not a Diglet, it's a completely different Pokemon, it's a Wiglet. But, you know, if Wiglet didn't extend out of the ground and look wormy the way it does, and you changed its name to uh, Palladian Diglet, Palladian Diglet, it would be a regional variant. The good news is they didn't do too many of them. I think there's like a handful, maybe three or four total regional or not regional variants of these not regional variant Pokemon. And then there's two or three regional variants. So the good news is that they kept regional variants to a minimum, which I'm happy with that. So I think Game Freak, I think the fact that they did this Wiglet thing shows that Game Freak is aware that they're at least aware on some level that they don't need to be going, they don't need to be going out of hand with this whole regional variant thing. They don't need to get to those Digimon levels where there are 15 different varieties of the exact same Digimon. And the only difference between them is, you know, their color, or some small, some small variation on the features, physical features. And hopefully, the idea of the fi uh, the conceptual idea behind Pokemon like Wiglet will continue to evolve. So that we continue to see more Pokemon like that. And using that does help cut down on what are pure regional variants, 100% just, you know, regional variants, which are reskin slash retyping of existing Pokemon. I think I would be okay with that if the, if the approach they've taken in Scarlet and Violet is the approach they would continue to take in future Pokemon titles where they keep regional variants to a minimum, do these other things that are different Pokemon, but keep those to a minimum too, while preferring filling the Pokedex with Brand new, 100% new and original Pokemon, vast majority. I also... I could see that approach working. And thinking about that, that's another... Another feather in the cap for terrestrializing is that like Z-moves, doesn't require a brand new Pokemon design. Doesn't require a brand new Pokemon design, so you can't pad out the Pokedex like you could in uh, like you could in X and Y and to an extent in Sword and Shield. 
Gigantas Mega Evolutions and then the Giganta at Max Evolutions are our temporary forms that get all the development time and work of conceptualizing them as new Pokemon basically. New Pokemon evolution slash forms. But they aren't technically new Pokemon, so it's like doing half the work, basically. Because you, for instance, let's use the ever remaining Charizard. You take Charizard, you give Charizard a Mega Evolution or a Gigantamax form. You don't really need to give it new moves, so you don't have to worry about conceptualizing the move set or anything like that. You don't need new lore for it, you don't need Pokedex entries, you don't you only need to design the battle animation sprite for the when it Charizard transforms into that form. And that takes up an entire slot. Like, it doesn't go in the Pokedex, but it takes up a slot. You could say, you know, new Pokemon, new forms, you know, 77 new Pokemon slash forms. You see, you add that little asterisk there, slash forms. But in reality, you've only designed, you know, seven, you've only designed, you know, 60 brand new Pokemon from the ground up. That are new entries into the Pokedex, brand new, new numbers, entirely original. You designed the entire thing from the ground up, base forms, evolutions, move sets, lore, sprites, variations, shiny forms, all of that. And my fear with the Mega Evolution slash Gigantamax style of style of battle mechanic, gimmick mechanic as they call it. My concern with that was that they were slowly replace adding new Pokemon to the Pokedex. That Game Freak would use it as a way of avoiding that big number 1000 for as long as possible even though I figured it was not possible to avoid hitting 1000 Pokemon on Scarlet and Violet if you're going to have any sort of game worth playing have to introduce a lot of new Pokemon. A significant number, a decent number. I haven't looked at what the final tally was, but if it's more than a hundred new species of Pokemon introduced in Scarlet and Violet, I am very pleased. That's what I was hoping for. So, I think that I think that's it for that concern. Now, Beato is about to evolve, I believe. So let's see that evolution. Oh, here we go. One of my favorites. Good old reliable fly guy. Flygon who I believe got nothing in Scarlet and Violet. I'm not even sure if Flygon is in Scarlet and Violet, which would be a shame. But not surprising. Now the problem is, I need to teach Flygon a dragon type attack. It should probably know Dragon Breath. So, I should, well, I would have to hunt down some heart scales. 
then visit the movie learner and see if I can teach it Dragon Breath. I think that would be worth it, since it is a dragon, to have to have some dragon type moves. But that's an idea. So another thing about Scarlet and Violet. Now this is something that's not so much concern. It's not so much concern because I haven't actually experienced it yet, but I'll probably experience it in my next play session since I'm probably going to try to start looking at what the whole breeding mechanics are like and what what it's going to take to start working on creating some competitive style Pokemon. Still too early in the game. Really, I should be waiting for the post game, but I'm curious, so I'm gonna try and see what the whole breeding thing is like. Especially since I had the good fortune of getting a female starter right off the bat. I picked Quaxley, and it just happened to be female, so that's all well and good for me in terms of uh, breeding, because. I can breed and get baby Quaxi. I can breed and get baby Quaxi before I give uh, before before the point in the game where I could find Ditto. Even though I've already reached that point and found Ditto. But I hear that the breeding mechanics have been entirely changed. Now when you go into the picnic setting with Pokemon that are compatible for breeding, then an egg will be left in a basket somewhere. I haven't had a chance to use the picnic feature yet, so I'm just going off what I've heard and read online. And I haven't tested this feature out yet, but I am intimately familiar with the breeding process in the other games. So I'm wondering if that would be just an adjustment that I have to make to get used to the new breeding style, all the mechanics are the same. Egg moves, passing down natures, destiny not, ever stone, all that stuff's the same, so there's no worry there. All of your breeding knowledge from previous generations and games, all of that still applies. The only difference is the breeding process itself. There's no daycare center, there's no going, talking to the NPC, dropping off the egg, riding your bike, waiting for them to turn to indicate that the egg is spawned and you go pick up the egg. There's none of that. And I think that process is where there will be a learning curve how to handle that new process of going to the picnic with the compatible Pokemon and waiting for the egg to spawn, I think. You have to wait for the egg to spawn. And I don't know if it's step-based or time-based in terms of waiting for the egg. It should be step-based somehow, but I haven't looked into that yet, but learning that stuff. I don't think it'll be too bad of a adjustment and learning curve. So that's why I'm not listing that as a full-on complaint, as in this feature is worse than what breeding used to be. I think it might be the same, or maybe a little bit better, maybe a little bit worse, but not too bad. It'll mostly be exactly the same as what we're used to, so... Not listing that as a full-on concern. increased shiny rate. Not personally a concern. I'm neutral on that, so personally I don't consider that a, a buff to the game or a detraction. Okay, I guess I'll leave off here since Flygon has evolved. Let's see. Yeah, maybe I'll try to get Flygon to level 46 in the next episode, then we'll push Igna to level 46. Then, I guess we will switch to get Teresa and... To get Teresa and another party member. And get them to level 46. Which shouldn't be too long. 
I think in probably another episode or two, we should be ready to start facing the Elite Four, probably. Maybe I'll have to try and find a way to earn some money so I can buy some healing items in case it turns into a legitimate run on the Elite Four and I need healing items. But I suppose we'll start worrying about all that when we get to that point. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and comment and subscribe. I'm trying to reach 500 subscribers by the end of the year. I'm at like 472 or so. So I very much appreciate your subscription if you like this content and want to see more. And until the next episode, thank you for watching and I will see you all later. Take care.